career advice, missing pigs, doves, and dirty feet. Of course, I'm talking about the Oracle of Zeus at Dodona on the Ancient History Hound podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Ancient History Hound podcast. My name's Neil, and in this episode, I'm looking into the Oracle at Dodona. Trust me, you're going to want to listen to this one, mainly because the Oracle had a lot of very personal questions, which has survived and gives a great insight into what the average person was thinking and what they were worried about in ancient Greece. But before I get to them, I'm going to discuss the history of the sanctuary and how it changed over time. But yes, those questions, it's definitely worth waiting for them. Now, before I do that, a couple of quick points. All of the dates, unless otherwise specified, are BCE, and you'll be able to find a set of episode notes with a transcription of this episode on ancientblogger.com and keep those reviews and ratings coming. I've had some crackers recently, so again, thanks for those. In an episode with questions as a theme, I'm going to begin by asking you one. Where do you think Dodona was or is? There's no judgment here. Prior to researching this podcast, I was aware of it and knew something about it, but putting a pin on the proverbial map was, well, pretty much beyond me. Naturally, there's a map of Dodona on the episode notes, but I'll try to describe it as best I can, so here you go. If you think of mainland Greece, you normally think of the southern part, the Peloponnese, with Sparta, Corinth and Olympia. To the northeast, you've got Athens, and going northwest, you've got Thebes and Delphi. And for many people, well, that's it. Even the recent Assassin's Creed Odyssey had focused the area around Delphi as the furthest west you could travel on the mainland. Dodona is in that part of Greece which, well, didn't get much attention in antiquity or in modern day gaming. It's far to the west. In fact, it's closer to mainland Italy than it is Athens. The region it sits in was later termed Epirus and nowadays it borders Albania to the north with the Adriatic coastline on its western shore. The site itself is set in foothills and approximately 800 metres above sea level and to the east of Mount Tamaros. Though we can now hopefully place Dodona on the map, it's harder to do so on a historical timeline. Exactly when Dodona was founded is left to speculation, possibly in the middle of the third millennia, so around the time the Great Pyramid of Giza was being built. At the other end of the speculative sliding scale, a date of the early 2nd millennium is cited. Moving through the 2nd millennia, finds at the site indicate a possible Mycenaean involvement with axe heads and spear points. And it's assumed that the original deity worshipped here was some form of mother goddess, with the oak tree, the one constant, acting as a focal point for it. After the 8th century, things change, with tripods, figurines of athletes, warriors and animals appearing along with the bronze jugs. And it's at this point, still in the Archaic period, where Zeus is referred to as the main deity at the site. And we begin to have textual evidence surviving which gives us even more insight, and I'll pick up on that in a moment. The mother goddess hadn't been replaced, rather adopted into the form of Dione, the titan who in one myth was the mother of Aphrodite. And again, before I go further, this isn't unusual. The story of that other great oracle, the one at Delphi, incorporated founding myths where Apollo takes over the site from a previous cult by defeating a dragon or a serpent there. When I pick up with the mythic backstory of the donor, this theme, or reclaiming or taking over a site, will appear again. In the 5th century, or possibly the early 4th century, the first known building appears at the sanctuary. It wasn't a particularly overwhelming one, it was a naiskos or small temple measuring 4 metres by 6.5 metres and it stood near the oak tree. A wall was built later in the 4th century enclosing the tree and the naiskos and this was enlarged in the 3rd century. And it was in this century that the sanctuary saw drastic changes and initially because of an individual you may have heard of, Pyrrhus. Here's someone who often flies under the radar. He was hailed as one of the great generals of antiquity and fought Rome in southern Italy and Carthage on Sicily. He was the first to introduce war elephants to the central Mediterranean. In fact, the Carthaginians picked up on the idea when fighting against him. 
In the early 3rd century, Pyrrhus oversaw renovations of the Temple of Zeus to something a bit more impressive there. He also added temples to Heracles, Themis and Aphrodite. And then there were administrative buildings as well as a theatre added. Part of this was down to how Epirus as a region had developed and so Dodona became a sort of political centre for it all. Because it was something of a latecomer in this regard. Where the other regions around Greece had city-states and started developing in that way, Epirus hadn't. It hadn't been a cohesive political entity it was now. The sanctuary was sacked in 219, and to give some perspective, it was around this time that a young general called Hannibal was planning his march on Rome. But it was restored with a brand new stadium and temple to Dione. Unfortunately, Rome happened, and in 168, Greece was taken under Roman rule, and Dodona suffered. Though it crept along, the final coup de grace was given by the Christian emperor Theodosius in the 4th century CE. He banned pagan temples and cut down the famous oak tree. So even if you take the more conservative estimates of Dodona as starting around 1800, it was a site which people had travelled to for over 2,000 years. The archaeology can tell us something about it, and especially the records of those questions I'll come to later, but we know more about Dodona from the surviving literary references, which start in the Archaic period and in Homer. In the Iliad, Achilles sits in his tent and thinks of his soldiers and Patroclus, who will soon be fighting without him. He pours a libation to Zeus, and I quote, Zeus of Dodona, god of Pelasgians, O god whose home lies afar, ruler of wintry harsh Dodona, your interpreters, the Selly, live with feet like roots, unwashed, and sleep on the hard ground. End quote. The appeal to Zeus continues and centres on Patroclus both fighting well and returning safely, and Homer commented that Zeus heard the libation and granted one wish, but not the other. As you may be aware, Patroclus fought well, but he failed to return, and this is a central element to the myth of Troy and certainly the poem. Appealing to the Zeus of Dodona at such an important moment suggests that this was a known about an important place. There's also other details mentioned about Dodona. It was cold. And what about the Selly who slept on the ground and had, well, unwashed feet? In the Odyssey, we find the hero Odysseus back at Ithaca. He's yet to reveal himself as being hosted by Eumaeus. When the swineherd asks who he is, Odysseus comes up with an entire backstory as he's wont to do, but also included in it how he'd heard that Odysseus had gone to Dodona and, I quote, to learn the will of Zeus from the great oak tree that is sacred to the god, end quote. This detail was repeated later when Odysseus, again in disguise, spoke to Penelope. More details about how the oracle functioned and even how it all started are given by the 5th century historian Herodotus. In his work Histories, Herodotus dug into how it all came to be, and he did so by speaking with priests in Egypt and at Dodona. And you, you might wonder why Egypt? Well, according to the priests at Thebes in Egypt, two women were carried off by Phoenicians. One was sold in Libya and the other in Greece, and both founded oracles there. The Greek oracle was obviously at Dodona, and the Libyan oracle was the one at Ammon, which Alexander the Great famously visited. Herodotus also spoke to the priests at Dodona, or rather, the priestesses, and I quote, At Dodona, however, the priestesses who deliver the oracles have a different version of the story. Two black doves, they say, flew away from Thebes in Egypt, and one of them alighted at Dodona, the other in Libya. The former perched on an oak, and speaking with a human voice, told them that there on that very spot should be an oracle of Zeus. Those who heard her understood the words to be a command from heaven, and at once obeyed. End quote. Herodotus finished by summarising his thoughts on it all. To him, the doves were actually priestesses from Egypt who'd come to the region and established an oracle in the form that they'd previously done. In fact, Herodotus continues by explaining how the Greeks were instructed in much of their religious practices by the Egyptians. The idea that strangers from overseas could have a big influence on the Greeks isn't anything new, and in fact is probably something which is understated. Early Greek sculpture, particularly the Corae, those upright figures, are very reminiscent of Egyptian art. And then there are the wider influences. I think I've spoken about the alphabet from Phoenicia in the episode on Thebes. 
And while we're on the subject, the whole foundation myth of Thebes involved an overseas figure establishing a city in mainland Greece. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. What's also worth noting here is that even by the time of Herodotus, the age of classical Athens, the oracle of Dodona was considered old. I know that this is something which isn't always thought about, but there you have it. People in the classical period considering what was to them old history. Herodotus wasn't the only writer in classical Greece to mention the oracle. There were the playwrights. The talking oak is referred to by Aeschylus and Sophocles. In fact, the latter has Prometheus mention talking oak, so not just the one. And as for who worked there, Sophocles has both the male Selly and priestesses in place. However, a fragment of Euripides reads, and I quote, At the holy site of Dodona near the sacred oak, Females convey the will of Zeus to inquiries from Greece. End quote. Add to this that Herodotus only mentioned priestesses, even naming them, and it seems that it was an oracle where women were in charge. The difficulty with plays is that they're inherently set in the past, and perhaps Sophocles' inclusion of the Selai is just that. A constant we do have, though, is Zeus was the main deity here, and that he was linked to it through the oak tree. But this can be called into question, and I briefly referred to this earlier. Scholars have argued about Zeus being a latecomer at Dodona, perhaps only a few centuries old by the time of Herodotus, which is still old, but prior to Zeus the sanctuary belonged to a mother goddess deity, and that the tree was bound in some way to her worship. And this is by no means anything unusual. As I mentioned earlier, the other great oracle of Greece, the one at Delphi, had foundation myths which involve Apollo taking over the site and symbolically defeating a dragon there or a serpent. And perhaps this is echoed in the awkward nature of the Selly. The unwashed feet and the sleeping on the ground were features which bound them to the soil and the earth around the oak tree, and by default to the worship of the great goddess. So it's plausible that they had been a part of this and were later overtaken or supplanted by the priestesses when Zeus came to the fore. A key facet of the sanctuary, the oak tree, was now firmly associated with Zeus, though Zeus was often referred to here as Zeus Nios, which has been interpreted as both dweller and water flowing. The great goddess figure was rehashed as Dione, a titan who was mother to Aphrodite in the less ouch I need to cross my legs myth of her birth. All of this speaks to the, and I do the air quotes thing here, religion of ancient Greece. And I use air quotes as the word religion conveys a number of elements which aren't present in how the ancient Greeks related to their gods. There was no central text, no organised priesthood, and no singular way of doing it all. Depending on where you were, there may be a local hero who was worshipped or a deity in a manner which was unique to that location. After all, Zeus wasn't Zeus here, he was Dodonian Zeus, or Zeus Naios, and that was tied specifically to Dodona. To recap then, we have a form of Zeus acting as an oracle as well as Dione, at Dodona, by the classical period. So, how did it all work? So far we've had hints that birds were involved, which would not be unusual. Using birds for divination, particularly how they flew, was popular. Though talking trees, yeah, that, that's something else. But before I get to it, here's a few words from the Ancient Office Hours podcast. Hi, I'm Lexi Henning, host of Ancient Office Hours podcast. Have you ever wanted to learn more about the people who study or are inspired by classics in the ancient world? Then our show is the podcast for you. I interview experts in both academia and the entertainment industry about how they got into their field, their work, and how the ancient world inspires them. Our show is available to stream on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcatcher. You can also follow our upcoming projects on our website, theozymandiusproject.com. Thanks for that. By the way, you can find them at the ozymandiusproject.com website. It's definitely worth checking out. Okay, now back to that conversant oak tree. Observing how the doves moved within the tree or around it is plausible, But for the tree talking, well, perhaps we shouldn't take that too literally. One theory is that the leaves rustled in the wind, and this was how the oak tree spoke. But there was also the involvement of cauldrons placed around the tree, and these made a noise from being hit in some way. But the development of the site does cause a problem here. That wall which was built would have prevented these. 
but contrastingly may have helped amplify noise from a single cauldron through echoing. And trust me, as someone who podcasts from home, I can testify to how annoying walls are when it comes to echoes. We get an idea of how that single cauldron was hit from Strabo. In the first century, he described a statue which stood above the cauldron or what he described as a copper vessel. The statue was of a man holding a working whip. This was made of chains and had bones attached to it. When it struck the copper vessel, it made a sound and Strabo added that you could count to 400 whilst the vessel chimed. However accurate this account was, there's nothing which completely describes the process and dates to the classical period and up to the second century. It's possible that sounds and augury was used as well as other methods. It's just frustrating that we don't know more about how it all worked. But this is outweighed by what Dodona does tell us. From the 6th to the 2nd centuries, many thousands of people visited the site and asked questions. These were inscribed on small, thin sheets of lead and left at the site and are often referred to as the tablets, though these weren't the big stone variety you might be thinking of. Currently, we have just over 4,000 of them, though the majority are either ineligible or contain too few words to make out anything substantial from them. These lead sheets or tablets offer us that rare opportunity. As you'll hear, they give us an idea of what was bugging people in ancient Greece. And even when we don't have the question, there are still things we can learn, such as a particular spelling of a word, which might indicate the area of Greece that person came from. So I'm going to finish up by taking you through some, from the wider themes to the specifics and elaborating on how the question and answer process might have worked. I need to give a special call out to the work done on this and in my reading list you'll want to head to the pieces cited by Katsadmia, Chenyotis and Laius in the episode notes reading list section. I was also able to access many at dodonaonline.com though be warned the translation is from ancient Greek to French. Bit of extra work there. Let's start then with Epilatos. He had travelled to the oracle probably from southern Italy in the middle of the 4th century. His question was actually a few bundled together, and I'll read it just so you know the tablet did include an error which I've kept in, just in case you wonder. God and good fortune. Apelitos asked Zeus, Nios and Diona, by doing what, and offering to whom of the gods, he would succeed in life. Also, whether I should perform the trade in which I was educated, or start something different. Whether I shall shine in whatever he attempts to do, and whether... I should take Phanomena as my wife or another woman, and whether I should take a wife or remain as I am. End quote. The questions asked here are a good thematic aggregation of the common ones asked. Let's take the career advice he's after. This appears a number of times. For example, should someone change careers and become a horse breeder? And what about when I pay off my debt? Should I stop being a butcher? Specific commercial questions come into play. Around 375, a trader wanted to know if he should sell wine in Carthage. Another, if he should get into the copper market. Personal financial queries might relate to lending money or investing in a house. Failing that, giving it all up and trying something very new. Perhaps this challenges the idea that people were static in their careers in ancient Greece. The small insight we get from Dodona suggests that people are at least thinking of making big changes in their lives. A standout example is a tablet dating to the early 3rd century, which asks Zeus, Nios and Dione whether it's a good idea to join Pyrrhus on campaign. Perhaps this person went on to fight in Italy and Sicily, or perhaps he didn't. And then there's the personal, let's call it, well, relationship advice. Tied up along with career uncertainty, it seems that Apelitos had incorporated the narrative outline of many a rom-com and TV series. A pilotos in Paris. Nah, it doesn't particularly track well, does it? Concerns over relationships were often allied to an overarching theme. Will my marriage lead to children? And it wasn't just men asking about this. Take Clunica. She asked if she'd be able to have children from another husband. And she wasn't alone. Plorata asked whether or not she should have intercourse with Plato, son of Carpon, in order to secure children for herself. You might be surprised that women were asking questions, but religious observance, which is, after all, what this was, often gave women a space where they could act on their own or at least give them some agency. Aristonica, Aristobia, Ugaria, Eurytia, 
Phanomena, Gorgo, Clioretta, Lampito, Nisea, Pelopis, Phaen, Philantha, Sophia, and Vala all consulted the oracle as their names are present on the tablets, but we sadly don't know what they are asking. The topic of children was popular as you might expect, and it wasn't always whether you might become a parent. It could also be who was the parent. Take these two instances which I'll read out. Does the child belong to Alexander, son of Neoptolemus? And also, Lysanias asked Zeus, Naos and Dione whether the child Anilla bears is not his. Another query gives a further slant on who the daddy was. One tablet asked whether the child that Tata is carrying is from Amphinous, and it's been argued that Tata was actually a slave. We have a tablet which seeks to understand the best course of action on the other side of a scenario where a man had gotten a slave pregnant. The slave in question is named as Corridala, and the clarification needed is whether he, presumably the father, will succeed in buying them. Presumably the children as well as Corridala were the property of another man, and perhaps in this scenario the idea was to buy her and the children and possibly free them. I hope so. On the subject of slaves, one tablet is quite touching. It dates to the late 6th century and reads, and I quote, Zeus Naos and Diona, which god is it best to approach, and will I ever be free? End quote. Another dating to the 4th century is from a slave who wants to know whether, following his emancipation, he could still stay with his master. This might be a bit of a surprise, and it invites us to consider how being freed might have come with some challenges. Perhaps in this instance the slave and master had a relationship which the slave thought might be beneficial following his new status. Ex-slaves forming a relationship with their master wasn't unheard of in antiquity. The health of children and general health was a theme much as it is today. Given the rates of infant mortality, asking whether a newborn would survive seems more than a reasonable question. But there were also specific queries. For example, will my child ever make a sound? In the realm of health, one body part appeared more than you might think, the eyes. This isn't much of a surprise. Eye infections and afflictions were very common in antiquity, and tablets not only ask whether to use a different ointment, but which hero was best to sacrifice to, and even whether the ocular disease came from a goddess. Working out whether something originated from the divine or not was picked up in a 3rd century tablet where Agathokos asks if he should leave the cure to the gods or the doctors. And this has been cited as an early phenomenon where cures were segregated between the realm of the mortal and the divine. On the subject of mortals and healing, doctors are mentioned. Two mid-5th century tablets include the name of a healer called Paania, and one even suggested that she healed using her hands to cure the issue, and in this case it was an abscess. The format of the questions was often asking Zeus, Naos and Dione, and then the question itself, but there are also features of the questions which point to claromancy being used. This was divination by lot, and two features are cited as proof of this. The first is easier to describe, namely the words pick me being written in with the question. The second is, well, I'll, I'll let you spot it. Begin quote. Cleocrates and Amphimedon submit this query to Zeus Nios. Did Sindon not steal the flowers? End quote. Now, you might expect the question to be, did Sindon steal the flowers rather than not steal the flowers? And it's argued that this was due to both versions of the question being submitted with the hope that one was chosen to be answered. We don't know whether Sindon was indeed the flower thief, but here are some more general questions, and I reckon there's a few which resonate today. I won't do the begin end quote thing, I'll just read them as a list. God, good fortune, is Philotis the rightful owner of the iron objects? Does Agias share knowledge concerning the bowl of Poseidon? Melantus, did he steal the money? About the wheat that disappeared, did someone steal it? Did he use a magical potion against my offspring, or against my wife, or against me, from Lyson? Were Mirian and Euthydamnos, and, name unclear, privy to the theft of the pigs committed by Karinos? Did Dorkilos steal the garment? Will I be happy living with Asandros? Do I have to return the money to Nikias in the present circumstances? 
God, good fortune, about our brother, is there something else shameful coming? There's a lot of confidential content here, or at least stuff you might not want people to hear being asked. Well, there's an argument which I think is a brilliant insight into this. It works on the premise that many tablets were folded and had a single name or mark on them. We might imagine the priestess pulling out a tablet, calling out the mark, rather than reading the question aloud, and giving the answer. And on the topic of answers, a few have survived. Here are some. Again, I'll read them as a list. You are not pure. It is better to wait. You will be saved. He will be able. Not safe. And, yes, it's possible. This sounds a bit more like a politician's answer than a priestess's, but there you go. The tablets give us a wealth of information, and not just from what's written. Due to the nature of what survived, and what was ever put down to survive in the first place, the thoughts of the average person aren't easy to find. The donor is a curious mix. There's much we don't know, for example, the basic function of it all. True, we can speculate, but as yet there's not a great weight of evidence, and given the duration of the site, there was probably a changing method of divination which occurred over time. So any one of those ideas may have been right, and then it stopped and something else replaced it. But then there are the tablets, the slivers of lead, which held the wishes and concerns of people who travelled there, from slaves, from women, and concerning a range of queries, many of which I think are variations of what we think about today. It's a very special thing. And there, I'll leave it. Just remember to check out ancientblogger.com for the episode notes, transcription and reading list of the works I've used in the research. If you can leave a review, please do. Until the next time, take care and keep safe.